I'm your host, Duncan Elkinson, and today we're going to spend the entire show discussing the phenomenon that is Rudolph Valentino. Emily W. Leiter has written a new biography entitled Dark Lover, The Life and Death of Rudolph Valentino. It was published this spring by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and is available at local booksellers. Emily Leiter has done a fascinating job of doing great research copious annotations, and placing in the sociological concept the phenomenon that's Rudolph Valentino. I've always been fascinated with the life of Valentino, and this culminates a week of Valentinoism for me. It's in Southern California. It's late in August. It's the anniversary of the death of Rudolph Valentino. Welcome to Dateline USA. Glad to be here. Tell me, right off, why Valentino? Well, for a person who's interested in the American 1920s, Valentino is a perfect subject. In many ways, he's the incarnation of the American 1920s. Uh, start with the worship of celebrity, which we share with the 1920s. Go on to the worship of youth. He was a dancer. Uh, dancing is very important in the 1920s. He was a tango dancer. He introduced a new ideal of sensuality. We associate the 20s with sexual liberation, and he had something to do with it. I was able to sit down earlier this week with Emily Leiter, who was in town for the, for the observance of the passing of Rudolph Valentino and discuss with her the phenomenon of Rudolph Valentino. I asked Ms. Slider, why Valentino? Why does an immigrant a taxi dancer, a dancer for hire, become the most exceptionally noted exhibition dancer of his time, and then cross over to the new, new art form of movies? Emily told me this. Well, I think accident plays a part in all careers. And timing. It was a case of a man being in the right place at the right time. Also, his drive and ambition and talent should not be underestimated. Valentino really wanted to be famous. He worked very hard as an actor. And before he was an actor, he was a wonderful exhibition dancer. Uh, perhaps the more amazing leap was from him being a, a gigolo, a taxi dancer, a dancer for hire, to being a very highly paid and highly regarded exhibition dancer in New York, making $250 a week in 1915, which is a huge amount. Uh, so he, he was going somewhere even before he came to California. I think he had his eye on a career in the movies from very early on because he started getting bit parts when he was still in New York and still working mainly as a dancer. And I think that he always dreamed of coming to California. You know, here on Dateline, we interview a lot of biographers. And I'm always fond of quoting the great lexicographer, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who said, it's the biographer's job to have lived in social intercourse with his subject. So I wanted to know from Emily what it was like being Rudolph Valentino, being around Rudolph Valentino. Now, Emily Leiter is no stranger to biography. She's written a well-received biography of the novelist Gertrude Atherton 
and several years back wrote a wonderful biography of Mae West entitled Becoming Mae West. So I was fascinated with her, her answer to the question, what was it like being around Rudolph Valentino? It's a roller coaster ride because, as you know, because you've read the book, uh, he was a very emotionally volatile man. In many ways, quite immature. I think he never reached full adulthood as a, as a human being. He was like a, a kid, uh, extremely tempestuous, uh, extremely passionate, and for most of his life, extremely unhappy. So writing about him was not easy because his life is so sad and so much of the time he was so miserable. As you mentioned, my previous book was about Mae West. Mae West was a laugh a minute. Mae West had me bursting into ribald laughter in inappropriate places like libraries. Uh, she's just so funny and uh, uncontainable. Whereas Valentino, uh, as I said, is, is a very tragic subject. Uh, tracking him down was hard because he died such a long time ago and there are hardly any people around who actually knew him. I went to Italy, I went to his hometown in Italy and I was fortunate enough to be able to go there with some members of his family who live in California but yet they're his blood and they, some of them resemble him. So that was a very emotional and important part of how I was able to do the research. I really felt a connection, which I wouldn't have if I, A, hadn't gone to the, the hometown, and B, hadn't taken that trip with members of the family. It was a kind of bonding that went on that's important. Uh, Valentino was asked after he made a trip to Italy in the 1920s, uh, whether he was mobbed, whether the Italians treated him like a star. He said, no. He said, in Italy, there's a Valentino on every street corner. <laughs> One of the fascinating things I found out about Valentino when reading Emily Leiter's biography, Dark Lover, was that Valentino wasn't just a pretty face. I knew he was a dancer. I knew he was an actor. I had no idea that he had an interest in what was going on behind the camera. Not only was he interested in what was going on behind the camera, he owned motion picture cameras and set up a lot of his own shots. This is what Emily Leiter said when I asked her, what type of control did Rudolph Valentino have over his career? Yes, he loved cameras and he was very adept with them and he had movie cameras and still cameras. Uh, he loved to tinker as well with cars and to fix them. And he. Uh, he thought of being some kind of an engineer. He was very gifted with gadgets of all kinds, and he loved them. And what control did he have over his career? Not enough, is the short answer. Valentino was not only not gifted in business, he was a disaster. He was his own worst enemy, and he made some very poor judgment calls when it came to which studio to go with, what contract to sign, and how to handle uh, the people in control. He botched it over and over and over again, made bad choices. At the same time, he didn't get to be Rudolf Valentino without having an instinctive sense of what was needed and what he could, what he could give. Uh, his dancing and his face originally got him cast as Julio in The Four Horsemen, and that was the role that made him a star. When he first came to Hollywood in 1917, leading men were square-jawed, all-American types. They were called arrow-collar men because they looked like advertisements for arrow shirts. Broad-shouldered, square-jawed, look you straight in the eye, fair complexion, usually, not always, at Fairbanks, who was a leading man, did not have a fair complexion. But you were not supposed to look foreign. 
and D.W. Griffith notoriously refused to cast Valentino because he said, he looks too foreign, the girls would never go for him. <laughs> and it was a woman screenwriter, June Mathis, who recognized that the girls and women would go for him precisely because he looked foreign. Mm -hmm. And I should say something about what happened to change the tastes of American women. Partially they changed because of Valentino, but partially there was a change in the air that made their receptiveness possible. I think World War I had a lot to do with making this country less provincial less aware, uh, less uh, isolated from the rest of the world, and particularly more aware of Europe. A lot of American soldiers, after all, went to Europe. And you perhaps know the song, How Are You Going to Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? Well, Valentino was the embodiment of European sophistication to the American woman. Mm -hmm. He always played sheiks rajas, gauchos, Cossacks, but he was a European and women knew this. Uh, off camera, he was a fashion plate, very, very elegant, he had a huge wardrobe. Uh, he had continental manners, he would kiss a woman's hand, he would bow. He wore jewelry and he, and he was proud of that. This was not something American women were accustomed to seeing in men, but when they saw it, they really liked it. I know Valentino from movie posters, from clips of old silent films. I don't know what he was like in person. I never had the opportunity to meet him. But he had a mesmerizing effect with, over women. So I asked Emily Leiter what it was like for, for Rudolph Valentino to be with the opposite sex. Was he comfortable? Was he uncomfortable? She had a very fascinating insight to what Rudolph Valentino's relationship with the opposite sex was all about. Anybody who reads Pat Valentino in detail concludes that he over and over again sought out very strong women he sought out maternal women. He was always really on better terms with the mothers of the young women he would date than he was with the young women, almost always. He adored his mother. He adored his sister. He did not have a good relationship with his father. And although he had a friendly, warm relationship with his older brother, they were not close when they were growing up. So I think. Valentino was very woman-oriented, and this is one of the reasons that he appealed so much to women. He knew how to talk to women, but he was not a skirt chaser. He was not, Chaplin was a, a skirt, notorious skirt chaser. Uh, Valentino respected women, and I think that from pretty early on, he had an ambiguous record sexually with women. I don't think that he was a Don Juan. I don't think that he was a tiger in bed. I think that he had some passionate love affairs, but he also had some disastrous experiences with women. So he was maybe a bit of a wounded deer. Rudolph Valentino was married twice, both times to actresses, but very, very different people each time. I asked, I asked Emily Leiter what Rudolph Valentino's marriages were all about. Well, married in L.A. very soon after he got there and very soon after the death of his mother in France during World War I. He married a young actress who had a contract with Metro. Her name was Jean Acker. At the time they married, Jean Acker was more famous than Rudolph Valentino. By the way, I should tell the audience that Valentino was not his real name, of course. Uh, his real name was Rudolfo Guglielmi, and he changed it for obvious reasons. Nobody could spell or pronounce Guglielmi. Valentino was a wonderful name for him. His name was Rudolfo Guglielmi, and he changed it for obvious reasons. Nobody could spell or pronounce Guglielmi. 
Valentina was a wonderful name for him, with its suggestions about the heart and St. Valentine's Day. So he married Jean Acker, who was a contract artist with Metro and who was a very close friend, indeed a lover of Allah Nazimova. He claims, he told his friend, that he was naive enough to not realize that Jean Acker preferred women to men sexually and that she and Nazimova were lovers. Maybe it's true that he was that naive, but certainly he found out on his wedding night that Jean Acker was not interested in sleeping with him. I did an interview with Patricia Neal, who knew Jean Acker, and uh, she told me that Jean Acker had told her that the reason the relationship was not consummated was that Valentino had a venereal disease. And that may be true, but you wonder why they got engaged and why they got married if this, if this was the case. And why did he not tell her until the night of their wedding night? It's all very mysterious and rather strange. And uh, the best you can say is that it was overly hasty on both of their parts, uh, that both of them were trying to solve other problems. Former dancer and then a costume and set designer, also connected with Alan Nazimova, who took the name of Natasha Rambova. Natasha Rambova was born Winifred Shaughnessy in Salt Lake City. Uh, Winifred Shaughnessy is not a suitable name for a prima ballerina, and that was her aspiration. And indeed, she was in a Russian ballet company, and she started out as the protege and lover of Theodor Koslov, the dancer who also was in movies. And Koslov really treated her and several others as, as his love slaves. And she wanted out eventually. And Valentino first saw Natasha, who was very, very beautiful, statuesque, gorgeous complexion, wonderful clothes, tremendous sense of style. He saw her on a set at Metro uh, and walking with her toes out. and. Uh, he used to whisper to the other actors, here comes Pavlova. Natasha was rather haughty. Her mother had married wealth the second time and the third time uh, and lived the life an of an aristocrat. They had houses in France and San Francisco. And although Natasha initially was independent and wanted to earn her own money, I think she acted like somebody who was born to privilege. She was haughty and haughty, and this was something that attracted her to Valentino, who always was socially mobile and looking to advance himself. So he, he liked to hang around with people who were wealthy and socially prestigious. Uh, and he initially, even when he first came to this country, he pretended that he himself was a marquee, which was not the case. So Natasha was beautiful, she was talented, she was cold and haughty. Initially, wouldn't give him the time of day, and that drove him nuts, and he had to have her, and eventually he did win her. They lived together before they were married, because he had married Jean Acker, and he wasn't divorced yet. But they were very, very eager to marry. They went off to Mexico and got married in Mexicali before the final divorce decree was in hand. And so publicity-seeking district attorney in L.A. charged Valentino with bigamy, and he was jailed. And he and Natasha had to live separately. Eventually, they did tie the knot legally a year later, but this was a big scandal. It was right after the Arbuckle brouhaha. So the studios were trying to appear squeaky clean, and they did not protect Valentino when he was charged with big bigamy. They didn't even give him bail money. Uh, he was furious, and that was one of the reasons he left Paramount 
in a rage and went on strike for two years. By the age of 31, after a career that had spanned less than five years, Rudolph Valentino was dead. He died of a perforated ulcer, and the shock waves were heard throughout the country. He had a massive funeral, and of course there was a lot of media attention. It may well have been the first media funeral of the 20th century. I wanted to know from Emily Leiter how much of it was social phenomenon and how much of it was actual media hype. True, and it was, I mean, those fans were flamed by the tabloids, for sure, and, and the studios who wanted to make money on the last movie. But the emotion was genuine. People really were absolutely flabbergasted that this image of youthful beauty and prowess could be struck down so suddenly and without any preparation. It was, it was just, it was like something like Princess Diana. He, he's very current in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think screen, screen actors now have as much power over the public as they did in the 20s. Because there's television, there's rock, uh, there, there are other avenues for stars to travel on. And the movies were it in the 20s. There was vaudeville, but the movies was the mass medium. And uh, many people went to the movies several times a week. And they weren't jaded. This was all new. Movies were brand new. Uh, so the idea of a movie star was pretty new. Uh, so the impact was just immense, enormous. The Museum of Modern Art owns quite a few Valentino movies. And uh, we're going to show all of them, all that are in their collection. Plus, we're going to show a satire of the chic called A Short with Ben Turpin, the cross-eyed comic, called The Shriek of Araby. Uh, so it'll be fun for people to be able to first see the chic and then see the takeoff on the chic. People did make fun of Valentino as well as adoring him. Uh, we're going to show The Four Horsemen, uh, Monsieur Beaucaire, which was not a big hit, but which was uh, an important movie because Natasha did a lot of the costume and design work. And uh, the curator at the Museum of Modern Art it has located the original musical score, and that's going to be played. I want to thank Emily Leiter for spending time with us this week when she was in Los Angeles. It was particularly interesting to have her insights to the life and death of Rudolph Valentino. Again, her book is called Dark Lover, and it's available in bookstores. I also want to thank our staff, the production staff and the studio staff, who make this show possible week after week. And in particular, I want to thank our subject today, Rudolph Valentino, the Sheik, the Four Hostages of the Apocalypse, the first media idol. As a way of, of thanking Valentino, and as an extra added treat to all of our viewers, we actually will give Valentino the last word today. The voice you will hear is the recorded voice of Rudolph Valentino. Thank you for watching.
done. There was no way I was instrumental in it being done, but I did not want ever to force my own self, my own personality, uh, upon people. If people sought uh, for, for me to come forward, and I knew that they were sincere in their approach to the subject, and that their approach towards me as an individual was not a foolish or silly one, and I was quite happy to come and to speak. Of course, there are exceptions. There are certain instances of which uh, I don't think I wish to enter now. But there are individuals in the back of the stage and they are sitting down to the living room. They are interested to do it being done. But I did not want ever to force my own self, my own personality, uh, upon people. If people sought uh, 